No man coming unto the Father except they come through He. He is the way. Oh, he is the truth. Oh, he, he is the life. I said that He is the way. The way. I love He. I said he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I know that he is the way, the way, the I love he is the truth, I said he is the way, the way, the truth, the life. Listen to me now. No man coming unto the Father except they come through he. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Listen to me. No man coming unto the Father. Except they come through, he, he is the way, oh, he is the truth, he, he is the life. I said he is the way, the way, the I love he is the truth, the truth, the truth. I said he is the, the way, way, he is the, the truth, oh, the life. I know that he is the way, the way, the I love he is the truth, the truth, the truth. I know that he is the way, the truth, the life. And Philip asked me, said, Lord, can you show us the Father? And that'll be enough for me. He is the way. Oh, he is the truth. Oh. He is the light. And Jesus answered, Don't you know I'm the Father? And that the Father's in me. He is the way. Oh. He is the truth. He is the light. Yeah. I said he is the way. The way. The I way. said he is the truth. The truth. I said that he is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. I said he is the way. The way. The way. I said he is the truth. He is the light. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to The Way, The Truth, and The Life. My name is George Boyd Jr., and I'm the minister here at the Wheeling Church of Christ in Greenville, Texas. So if you're ever in the area, please come by and visit us as we are Bible Church and we do Bible things, uh, Bible ways. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Well, welcome, Mary. Uh, You said it's hard to get around this time. It's dinner uh, time for the hubby and I. Oh, okay. But today is an easy meal. Okay. Y'all have dinner pretty early. Now you are in the States, right? Let, let me know. We may have to do some chatting uh, sometimes later on here. Uh, but welcome once again. Good to see you here. Today we, we're going to have a very, very enlightening, uh, very, very enlightening lesson. A very powerful lesson is we're going to... Uh, learn about this thing you know a lot of people love this scripture of i can do all things i can do all things through christ jesus that strengthens me oh man people love that scripture but one of the things that i like to help people with is to make sure that when you're using a scripture that you are using that scripture appropriately and not in a way that it was not meant to be used and Someone says, well, what's the heart in that? What, uh, what's the harm in that? Well, you know, the harm in that is if we use Scripture wrong, then people who don't know Scripture will use Scripture wrong. People who are not educated on Scripture, they'll use Scripture wrong. They will apply it wrong in, in different, different times in their life. They'll, they'll be thinking that a Scripture is saying one thing to enable them to do something that Uh, Maybe God doesn't want them to do when in actuality, it's not God that is strengthening them, but it is themselves. They are enabling themselves rather than God himself enabling them rather than God himself enabling them. So today we're going to really, and I don't know, maybe not dive as deep as we dove into some scriptures, but I do want to take a deep dive into this very powerful scripture so that this scripture will empower your spirit. (coughs) I'm sorry. So that this will empower your, your spirit through God. And so let's go to this. Oh, this is so this is this scripture. I'm telling us, I'm just going to be, just say it right from the beginning. This scripture is actually more powerful than people give it credit for. It's actually more powerful than people give it credit for. I can do all things Philippians chapter 4 because this particular portion of the book of Philippi, uh, the book of Philippians, this portion of the scripture, good afternoon, Sister Whitfield, this portion of the book of Philippians is where Paul begins to kind of give the explanations 
of why he has written this letter to the church at Philippi. You know, there is a very major reason as we look at the issue between Euodia and Syntyche, but there is also the issue of Paul is also joyful that the church at Philippi has been able to, has regained the ability to help him in his ministry, to help him in his ministry. And, and I think there are some things in here that really gives us some PowerPoints as why does he say, I can do all things? Because a lot of people will apply, I can do all things to everything they do in life. They come up against any obstacle, and the first thing they say, well, I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. Well, we're going to learn what all of that mean because all of that means because that one verse is so loaded. And we won't go uh, very far back, but we are going to dip and dive through the book of Philippians because I think Paul gives us a clear indicator of what he's talking about. So let's dive in. This is why I tell people you got to be very careful just reading one scripture or one part of a letter because you may make it say something that it's not saying. You have to read a letter in its entirety. Amen. So I think when we kind of get some of the things in it, uh, get some of the other thoughts of Paul in the letter to the Philippians, I think we're going to really, really be blessed today. Amen. Amen. So before we get started, let us say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you once again for allowing us to wake up on this side of life. Ask, Father God, that you be with us throughout the remainder of this service. We ask, Father God, that a blessing go out through your word and that there is someone out there who needs to hear it, Father God, that it can help them and edify them and, and even bring some to Christ, Father God. Let the word go out and let it do what it does, Father God, in your name. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, let us all say amen. So I want to bring out a point from the first three verses here that we're going to deal with. And I want to deal with this, per, this, this concept of satisfied. I want to deal with this concept of satisfied because satisfaction is something very hard, it seems, for many of us to obtain because we wrestle with wanting things. Sometimes we wrestle with things that we want. Or sometimes we wrestle with things that we need. I'm sorry. Sometimes we wrestle with things that we need. But a lot of times we're wrestling with things that we want. You know, we may have a car that's running, but we want a new car. Because the next door neighbor got a new car. You know, maybe we want some new clothes. Because it's not that our clothes don't fit any longer. But sometimes we just want some new clothes because we saw an outfit someone had on or maybe there was an advertisement on TV. Sometimes we're filled with food and we'll see some cookies on on television or some candy or we just say, well, you know what, I want a snack right now and I want to eat me some ice cream or whatever the case may be. The, 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 the issue of wanting, the issue of satisfaction, the issue of contentment, it seems to be something that is very hard for many of us to grasp. It's hard for us to be content with what we have. Sometimes God will, you know, he'll give us enough money and we'll say, but I want more money. And there's nothing wrong with making all the money that you can. Make no mistake about it. God is, the, God is not mad at, at us because if we will work, then we should, <laughs> the laborer is worthy of his pay. Amen. The laborer is worthy of his pay. But we do have to be, con we be careful because sometimes when we can't be satisfied, when we can't be content, when we don't have what we want, if we're not careful, we'll do whatever we have to do to get what we want. Even if that means going against God, even if that means being mean or doing wrong things to people or doing evil in the world. We have to be very careful. And so when we start looking at this whole issue about all things, this isn't quite blunt about getting all things, but it's about doing all things in a specific way. And so the first issue I want us to look at is satisfied, satisfaction. Paul is about to drop something real heavy on us. Watch what he says in this first verse. verse. Paul says, but, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last 
your care for me has flourished again. We call the letter to the Philippians the letter of joy or the book of the Philippians, the book of joy, because Paul talks about joy, 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 rejoice, joy. You know, and he says, I rejoice that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now, we're not really sure, you know, why did they lack opportunity? I mean, we can read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, and we can see where Paul, when he begins to talk to the church of Corinth about completing the offering, the offering that they were going to give to the poor Jews, we can see in that offering clearly that Paul mentions the churches at Macedonia. And he talks about even though they didn't have it to give, they gave anyway. And not only did they give, but they insisted on giving. And not only did they insist on giving, Paul said they gave even more abundantly than he even expected. Well, these churches at Macedonia, then these are actually the churches of Philippi or the church at Philippi. They're a part of that area. So we're not really sure how is it that, that, that they did not have the opportunity. We know also that, that, that they sent Paul Epaphroditus. I think we, we've learned about this in some earlier lessons we had a couple of months ago. So we're not really sure. But whatever the case may be, we know that the church at Philippi, they loved Paul. And they did not mind giving to Paul's ministry. Now, we also know something else about Paul, that when we read 2 Corinthians chapters uh, 8 and 9, there's some fascinating things we can find out about Paul's mindset. You know, you get these people who say, well, preachers should not get paid to preach. Well, this is the problem with people, and they don't understand. Preachers don't get paid to preach. Preachers make their living off the gospel as people are making their living off the gospel. Other people make their, they, they get their spiritual life. Their life gets edified off the gospel. So Paul says, well, that laborer, he's worthy. You, you should pay him. He's laboring in the gospel. You know, a lot of people don't understand what it requires to, and I'm not talking about for all, but for those who are truly trying to communicate the word of God, I am telling you, it is a task. It is a task, not only the study that it requires, but the humility that it requires, the time that it requires, the persecution it requires from people who may not like what you're doing. I mean, it is laborious. It is laborious on all fronts. So Paul did not take money from the church at Corinth because Paul knew that they were carnal. And Paul knew that if they took money from him, I mean, if he took money from them, he would be just like those eminent apostles that he talks about in 2 Corinthians 12 and 11. The very eminent apostles who wanted to take his place and who associated the, uh, the authority of a person on their recommendations, their accolades, how much they were getting paid, how much God was blessing them and all of those things. So Paul would rather brag and boast in not getting paid or taking a gift from them. But the church at Philippi were not carnal. And so Paul had no issue with taking a gift from them. But what I want us to focus in on is how is this tied into this very powerful statement of I can do all things. Watch this. God is about to bless our life. I remember when I first studied this and discovered this, it's mind-blowing when you pay attention to what Paul is saying. It's mind-blowing. Amen, Sister Mary. The, the, the word is, the, the key word is gift. And, 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 and watch this as we start getting into this whole issue about lacking opportunity because he's going to really say something here. I don't think people grasp the opportunity. It is a privilege. It is a privilege. And I don't ever want us to forget, forget this. It is a privilege to contribute to the ministry. It is a privilege. A lot of people don't like this, but I, I, I'm not a 
I'm not a prosperity preacher. I, I don't solicit money from people, but I will help. I do want people to understand something. Uh, ministry costs money. Welcome, Sister A. Bear. Welcome, welcome, uh, Devon Charlie. Welcome. I, I, I'm telling us, ministry costs money. But we have to be very careful because there are some, it's not so much that ministry costs money, they love money. There's a difference in the ministry costing money and the minister loving money. Amen? There's a difference. Paul was not a lover of money, but he understood the ministry required money. But he's also saying something about those who give to the ministry. He says, but you lack opportunity. But we have to understand, we, 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 shouldn't, we, we shouldn't disregard those opportunities because of what the ministry does when it is the right ministry. And I'm telling us something, we should scrutinize ministries. Churches don't do this enough. Some churches just give to uh, organizations just so they can say we're doing something so that they can sit on their, hand, sit on their hands and, and never do anything outside the pews because they can say, well, I'm doing something. I gave to this organization, and I gave to this organization, and I put money in the, in the collection plate, and the collection is going to, to, to this, this. No, no, this is, it's not an excuse not to do things in the ministry. But we do, as I said before, the ministry does cost money. Devon said, yes, sir, what a privilege it is, the opportunity we have in the preaching and the living of the gospel. Amen. It's all in, in, in people who participate in the ministry. We're going to get to that in a moment, Devon. It's so powerful because Paul is saying something. No, you're not paying for the ministry. You're not financing the ministry. You're contributing to the ministry through God. You're a partner in the ministry. People who contribute to ministries, they're partners in those ministries. They should know what those ministries are about. And, and, and understand before they contribute to them. Uh, Mary says it is, but some ministers of the faith take advantage of the flock. They do. They fleece us and our interests and instead of lead us. Amen. So watch this because this verse 10 is actually key and it's going to come back into play as we get at the end of this lesson. But Paul is rejoicing, but watch what he says. I underlined this on purpose because Paul said, not that I speak in regard to need. Oh man, that line right there. Not in regard to need. You, you know what Paul just said? Because God is going to provide either way. So I'm not rejoicing because you gave me money. See, some people rejoice when they get something. People rejoice when they get something that they want. But Paul is saying something. I'm not speaking in regard to not only want, but I'm not even speaking in regard to need because I know that God is a provider. Follow this line of thinking. People don't get this. He's rejoicing for their sake, not for his sake. Not that he's not happy because he is, he's definitely understanding that everything comes through God, through Christ, right? Oh, it's not that he doesn't, he, he's not thankful because this is the whole purpose. He wants to thank them for the gift, but he also wants them to understand. But let me keep you spiritual. I'm not speaking in regard to need. I'm not rejoicing in the fact that, hey, you have, you have financed this ministry, that you are the reason why this ministry continues. No, uh-uh. This ministry is going to continue regardless. Because if you didn't provide it, it would have been provided by God through some other means. See, Paul is saying something very powerful. I'm not speaking in regard to need. I'm not rejoicing because you gave me something. And this is a very powerful point we need to gravitate toward. Because a lot of times you see people, they're always glad when they think God has given them something. Oh, they're always glad. That's the very moment when you hear people say, oh, man, God is at his finest when he's blessing me with something. Oh, man, God is good. Oh, someone contributes a large amount of money to the ministry. Somebody said, oh, man, God is good. God is blessing this ministry. What about when large amounts of money is not coming into the ministry? Is God still blessing that ministry? 
What, 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 what about when, 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 when things are not going the way you want them to? Is God still blessing that ministry? We have to be very careful. We will, start, we will start associating the blessing of God with people giving us things rather than God providing things. Whether God may be providing something material. Maybe God is providing a person as in Epaphroditus, as in uh, Timothy, as Paul talks about in the letter to the Philippians, as he even talks about himself. Maybe God is providing something, strength, spirituality, through the humility that comes through the word of God. Maybe he's providing in that way. But Paul is saying something very powerful that we have to understand. Paul says, I don't want you to get it twisted. I want y'all because I love y'all and y'all love me. We're going to keep this thing spiritual. Amen. We're going to keep it spiritual. When I say I rejoice because now you have provided, you have provided this gift. You now have the opportunity again. Think about actually what he's saying. Sometimes people look at this as, well, you have the opportunity to give back to me. But I know what Paul is saying. No, God has blessed you once again, put you back in the, in the, put you back in a position to where you can fully or you can work in the ministry in all kinds of ways. We know they had sent him Epaphroditus, but now he can send them a monetary gift because what they were lacking, Epaphroditus provided. So Paul is saying something about the ministry. Paul is saying something about the ministry, and he's saying something about himself that I keep going no matter if someone provides or not because God is going to provide. Because Paul says, for I have learned. I have learned. Paul is actually saying something I don't even think we're hearing. Paul says, I have learned. I have found the answer to the, to the mystery that it has been revealed to me. I have learned in whatever state I am, whatever condition, whatever condition I am to be content. What does content mean? To be satisfied. To be satisfied. To say God's grace is sufficient. That no matter what state I am. I am content. I've learned this. How have I learned it? I've learned it from God. I've learned it from God. And not only someone says. Because I had to ask this question. I'm going to get to it. But I, I just got to spoil it. Because this is so good. But we got to ask the question. But, but, but how, did, how did God strengthen him? How did God strengthen him? How did he learn to be content and how was he strengthened by Christ? Because many people will say, oh, well, I'm strengthened by Christ. Well, how? Because if you don't know the how, then you're not strengthened by Christ. You have to know the how. You have to understand what does it mean? What is this mystery that was revealed? What is this great secret that, that is so, it, it seems to be a secret to many people in the world because we see, we cannot seem to be satisfied. I mean, you see people in the world, people are never satisfied. They're never satisfied with the way God made them. They're never satisfied with what God has given them. They're never satisfied with what they have. People always want more, 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 more. People want to do, I, I say sometimes, people do too much. People do too much. People say too much. Why? Because people are always craving for something. And I'm telling us, this social media age has ruined us. This social media age has ruined us. It has ruined us because we are always desiring a like. We're always desiring approval. We're always desiring a heart. We're always desiring something from somebody. But I've learned like Paul. I, I, I don't desire anything from man. Because if man is the provider then when man is no longer the provider, 
You cannot progress. You cannot proceed. You cannot pass, go, and collect $200. Why? Because you will always be depending upon man and what man gives you. But Paul says, but I don't speak in regard to need because Paul is saying something. Because my faith is not in man. My faith is not in people. My faith is not in being approved by man and being liked and being loved. My approval comes through God. The ministry is going to go regardless. That's where we have to learn. We, we, we want success. We want all these things. But we have to be able to be content with whatever, whatever that we, that's regarded as success. We have to be able to be content in that with the Lord. Watch this. Watch this. Mary says, you know, that what else is never satisfied? Lust. Yes. Amen. See, th this is the issue with people, but, but Paul learned. He figured out the secret. He got over it that no matter what state he's in, because I'm telling us the state that we're in, what kind of state of mind are we in? And I'm telling us something. We have to, we have to get closer to God through Christ because sometimes depending upon what's happening around us, our disposition changes. But this is why Paul continues to mention this whole thing about joy because joy cannot be based on happenings. Joy has to be based on something that is internal and eternal and that which is eternal must be internal. And when you have something that is eternal, internal from God, then you have joy. Because you know, no matter what the circumstance, God is with me. Watch this. I'm telling us, what did Paul mean when he said he did not speak for me? And I think I've explained this. So how did he learn? How did he learn? Wisdom comes from above. Whatever we learn, we have to learn it from God. Someone says, well, we learn from experience. But even in learning from experience, you have to learn through experience, going through it with God. Your experience without God is useless. Your experience without God is useless. You have to experience things with God so God can get you through. So God can get you through. God can get you over. God can keep you going. Because we have to be very careful. I know brethren who are so emboldened because they, they think they have overcome things on their own. They think they are the reason for everything. And in some cases they are because they've done it by hook and crook. They've done it through stealing. They've done it through lying. They've done it through holding back the truth. Yes, it, it, it's going to rise and fall on them. They have their reward. But those of us, when we can do all things and what are the all things but what when we can do things through christ jesus we have to learn we have to see how did paul learn philippians chapter 3 i think is the answer to this i think philippians chapter 3 is the answer to this brother devon i think it's the answer because paul says that though i might i might also he says though i also might have confidence in the flesh if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh i more so watch what paul does because there are men who love to brag about their accolades. These, we, we think, it looks like these are some form of Judaizers. Because Paul is saying, beware of the mutilators. He's telling them, watch out for these dogs. We, beware. We, we think they are these Judaizers, once again, who keep trying to mix the old and the new. Welcome, Sister Ann Bass. But, but I want you to see that men who put their confidence in accolades, their confidence is in the flesh. When a man makes a point to tell you that he has a doctorate in ministry, his confidence is not in God. His confidence is in the flesh. His confidence is in his education. When people tell you all the things that they've done, their confidence is not in God. Their confidence is in their achievements. When people tell you where they're from, what church they come from, some prominent church, when they tell you the, uh, the, the group they run with, some prominent group, well, their confidence is actually in the group. Their confidence is in the approval of men. Their confidence in, is in everything that brings them 
accolades that brings them the glory, brings them the attention, that men will put them on pedals, hold them in high esteem. Paul says, well, for men who do that, uh, let me let you in on something. I can actually brag more than they can because I have more credentials than they do. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Paul is saying something. I was born into this. Not into Christianity, but I was born into Judaism. If there is someone who could have been the Jew of Jews, well, I was born a Jew. Paul says, I was born on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Paul is saying, oh, yeah, you better believe I'm a Jew. I was born. I'm, I'm from the original, one of the 12 tribes. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, I'm going to give you my lineage. I'm going to give you my lineage. Not only am I going to give you my lineage, he says a, the, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Oh, you better believe he's not only giving his lineage, his lineage, his ethnicity. He's giving it all to you. He says, look, concerning the law, a Pharisee, yeah, my education, my, my education, not only my education, but the group that I ran in. Even though the Pharisees were self-righteous, selfish, and self-appointed, well, they were looked at as being the elite people of God. Uh, Paul was amongst that group. Paul said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisee. You better believe I was with him. He says, look, oh, concerning zeal, concerning zeal, I had a zeal for God, and through my zeal for God, I was persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, meaning that I kept the law to the letter. I was blameless. And I did all of this so that men could hold me in high esteem. I want you to notice something that Paul says right there, because none of that is, has anything to do with spirituality. You could follow the law to the letter and not love God. Uh, the Pharisees did it. Uh, the Sadducees did it. Uh, the Jewish leadership did it. All of these things that he's talking about, they brought him glory rather than God. So you say, well, how did he learn? How did he learn? Watch this. You ready? But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Watch this. Paul says they want to be judged by what they gain. I want to be judged by what I lose. Because I have learned that those things that get me glory will not bring glory to God. Because those things that were bringing me glory, I was actually going against God. I was actually going against Christ. Why? Because I was doing those things in actuality, some out of ignorance and a lot of it for myself. Oh, you better believe I was carnal. This is what Paul is saying. But I have, but what things were gained to me, Paul realized something. He learned that in order for me to gain Christ, I must give up these things that bring me glory. He says, yet indeed, I also count all things for loss. Paul is saying something. Anything that brings me glory, I count it as loss. I don't want to bring myself the glory in the ministry. I'm not trying to bring myself glory through the gospel. I'm willing to lose everything that many men would count as gain. How many men do you believe? How many men wish during Paul's time they had those accolades? How many people you think wish they had them? How many people? How people are willing to lose things for Christ? Amen, Sister Mary. Are people willing to lose things for Christ? Paul was. Paul was. Paul didn't have. I, I just marvel at how people talk about Paul today. I said it yesterday. I'll say it again. These people are nothing like Paul. They won't stand on truth. They love the approval of men. They go after every, every accolade they can get. They go after everything. They want everything. They, don't, they not only want to do all things, they want all things. But Paul is saying, but I gave up everything. I gave up everything. So that I could do all the things that God wants me to do through Christ. And I'm going to get to that in a moment because that's the key. 
Some people think he's talking about all things and misapply this. But no, Paul is saying all the things that God wants me to do through Christ. Because look at what he says. I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Knowledge means to know. He's not talking about an education. He's talking about a relationship. Some people want to be educated about Christ, but others want to have a relationship with Christ. And the way you get the knowledge of Christ is through his word, not what other men necessarily say about Christ, but what do men, are they saying what God says? Are they explaining the word? And he says for the excellence, because it is excellent. It is great to know the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, to have that relationship for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Just look at men today. Just look at them. I'm telling you. You can tell me what you want to tell me. Just look at a lot of them. They trade the truth for riches. They trade the truth for riches. They trade the truth for comfortability. They trade the truth for the approval of people. They trade the truth for people who want to sin. They want to sin and they want those people money. And so they'll stay away from sin. They'll stay away from the truth. They'll do anything they can do to keep the approval of those people. Mary says, amen. She said, people twist scripture so much just so they can do what they want to do. Uh, yes, Peter said that very thing. They twist up Paul's words. They twist them up so that they can do what they want to do. But Paul, he's trying to let us in on something. He learned something. That in order to gain Christ, you have to lose things. You have to lose those carnal things. You have to lose those things of the flesh. You have to lose things. He says, I've suffered the loss of all things. And I count them all rubbish. He's saying, and I don't regret it. Some people lose things and then they be looking back and they be talking about, oh man, I wish I would have did that. Oh, man, I wish I would have said that. Oh, man, I wish I'd have took that job. Oh, I wish I would have took that. Oh, I wish I would have did that to him. I wish I would have did that to her. No. We're not in this to defend ourselves. We're in this to defend the ministry. We're in here for the cause of Christ and not ourselves. So we're willing to take criticism. We're willing not to be accepted. We're willing to lose and, and miss out on quote unquote opportunities and accolades. We're willing to lose those things. And not only are we willing to lose them, but we count them as rubbish and we don't regret it. Paul says, and I don't regret it. That I may gain Christ because Paul is saying something. Regret will keep me from Christ. Through regret, I regress. But when I lose things for Christ, I gain Christ. Well, isn't that the goal? Isn't that the goal? Paul realized he was on the wrong path. On that road to Damascus, he was on the wrong path. Through all of his zeal, through all that he stood for, he was on the path of glorifying himself. I'm telling you, if Paul would have stopped the church, I want you to understand how he would have been looked at in the eyes of the Jews. Paul might have been the first pope had he been successful in destroying the church. But we know he wasn't going to be successful because Jesus said the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Amen. And not only that, but Paul, but, but, but Jesus came on that road to Damascus and scooped up Paul and said, no more. Now you work for me. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you everything you're going to have to lose to follow me. Oh, you better believe. Oh, I don't have time to go there today. But I'm telling us, look at what his goal is. He said that I may gain Christ and be found in him. You can't do things through Christ Jesus if you're not in Christ Jesus. We got people who are not in Christ. We got people who are not obeying God through Christ. We got people who won't follow Christ running around talking about, oh, I can do all things. Oh, you can sin? You can sin? You can have your cake and eat it too? 
You can live. No, no, no. Paul says, no, I want to lose those things. I want to be found in him. Look, not having my own righteousness. I'm telling us it is self-righteous for a person to think that I can sin all I want to and still go to heaven. That is self-righteousness. That's a person who is saying that the righteousness of God, I don't have to follow it, but guess what? But when I do stand before God, I will say, God, I might have did all those things wrong, but you know my heart and look at the things that I did do. Look at the good things I did do. No, that is self-righteousness. Paul said, I don't want to be found with my own righteousness. Look, which is from the law because the law, it, they had made it to the point. The law was not bad. The law was not bad. But what it could not do is that it could not save a man. It could not save a man. And we also see something else in the law when we read Romans chapter 7. It could not change a man's mind. It couldn't. It was supposed to change a man's mind through the symbolism, through what he was doing. But man, you have to be very careful. We can become very religious. We can compartmentalize. We can go to church on Sunday and fornicate on Sunday night. We can go to church on Sunday morning and cuss somebody out in the parking lot because people compartmentalize. I can worship God, but then I can still do and say anything I want to do. Welcome, uh, Brother Fowler. I'm, Fowler. I'm telling us. Because when I go to church on Sunday, people say, well, George went to church on Sunday. He preached a good sermon, but then I'm going to go curse somebody out at the same time. No, I am self-righteous. I am saying, God, well, I can serve you, but I'm going to definitely serve myself and do everything I want to do. No, that righteousness, which is from the law, that which makes me look good. He says, but that which is through faith in Christ, the just shall live by faith. Righteousness comes through faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You want to be in Christ. You want to abide in Christ. You want Christ to abide in you. Then you obey the word of God. Because Paul says, look, that I may know him. Paul, he figured it out. To know him. I got to give up some things. And, and let me go a little bit more deeper into this. To know him, I must know me. I must know me. I must know my desires. I must know my lust. I must know those things that I desire to make me great. And then once I know those things, give them up. Give them up. Give them up and don't regret it. You go through faith. You are saved by grace through faith. You want the righteousness that comes from the word of God. He says, I want the righteousness which is from God by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We, 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 I, I just wonder if we're getting it because I'm telling us Paul is saying something powerful. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What is the power of the resurrection? Oh, I don't have time to teach that all today. Let me summarize what the power of the resurrection is. The power of the resurrection is for a man, woman, or a child who can understand to, re to be reborn. God has the power to change us. Uh, the resurrection ought to change us. When we truly comprehend what Jesus did, I think Paul is saying something. I'm starting to comprehend it. I'm comprehending it the best way I can, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the power to help me to be or to make me have the rebirth, to make me a new creature to make me a new creature, the power of the resurrection, look, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul says that now that he has remade me, now I'm going to share in the same sufferings. I'm going to share in the persecution. 
I'm going to share in being persecuted. I'm going to share in people so mad at me for preaching and teaching and living the truth that they're going to want to kill me, that I'm going to rebuke. I'm going to reprove. I am going to tell men they are wrong. I'm going to encourage the people to do right in the face of adversity. I'm going to help men to be saved. I'm going to do it like Jesus. I'm going to do it. Why? Because I want to have fellowship. I want to share in those sufferings. Look, and he says, look, being conformed. I want to be conformed. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Do we know that when we are transformed, we are being also conformed? We are being conformed to his death. We are going to be faithful to his death. We're going to be conformed. We're going to march. We're going to carry our own cross. We're going to march on through this world in righteousness. I'm telling us, this is how he learned it. He learned it. He learned how to be content. First Timothy 6, 6 says, now godly, now godliness with contentment. Paul had godliness with his contentment. It, it, it wasn't a matter of Paul of, well, if I can't do it, I can't do it. No, no, that's not what he was saying. No, no, no. I am content with godly content. And if God is not doing, then I know he don't want me to do it. If God is doing, then I know he wants me to do it. If God has me in his state, he has me in this state for a reason. If he has me up high, he has me up high for a reason. He says godliness with contentment, being satisfied with what God has given. He said it is great gain. Why? Power moment. Power moment. Why is this great gain? Because when I have godliness with contentment, I'll never do anything to make it better for me while betraying and disobeying God. Amen, walls. We got so many people, they don't have godliness, and so they can't be content. They can't do it. They can't do it. They can't do it. But Paul is saying something very powerful. Wait a minute. Because verse 12, he begins to give us some more power moments. He says, look, I know how to be based. This is what's wrong with so many people. Oh, man, I'm telling this, Brother Fowler. This is what's wrong with so many people. This is what's wrong with so many people. Paul says, I know how to be a base. You know what Paul just said? I know how to be low. I know how to be low. I know how to be humble. I know what humility looks like. I know how to be abased. I know how to be on the bottom. See, some folk don't know how to be on the bottom. Not realizing they've been on the bottom their whole life, but they can't deal with it. They don't know how to be on the bottom. So they keep trying to scratch and claw and pull their way to the top. But we don't understand something. The way up is down. Paul says, I know how to be abased. Not only do I know how to be abased, I know how to be abound. I know how to be low. I know how to be high. You know what he's saying? I know how to carry myself. I know how to carry myself. Some folk don't know how to carry themselves when they have been humiliated. They don't know how to carry themselves. They don't know how to carry themselves when someone says something bad about them, when someone talks bad about them, when someone tries to put them down. Well, I'm not worried about you putting me down because you aren't the one who can put me down in the first place. The only one that can put me down is God. The only one that can lift me up is God. So I'm not worried about you. My, disp dis my disposition isn't predicated upon what you think about me. This is what's wrong with people. Their disposition is always predicated on whether I'm low or whether I'm high. Oh, if everything is going good, I'm feeling good. If everything is going bad, I'm feeling bad. Paul is saying something. Nah, not me. Nah, not me. No. No. I have godly contentment. I have it. Sister Veronica, hold on a second. She said, look, if people don't change according to the teaching through the word, she says, then people will be lost or people want to be lost. People will pick the things of the world rather than living their lives 
for the one who gave it. Amen. Amen. But see, this is the PowerPoint, ain't it, Veronica? Paul figured that out. That if Christ is the one who gave up his life, then Christ is the one who gives life. Amen? Oh, it is so powerful. Deshaun says the only one that matters is God. Amen. Amen. Paul is saying something. I know how to be abased. I know how to be abound. He says, look, everywhere and in all things. You know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying it don't matter what the situation is. It don't matter where I am. It don't matter the situation. It don't matter the time. It don't matter the place. It don't matter the people. Everywhere and in all things. Notice what he keeps saying. I have learned. I have learned. God had to teach Paul. I have learned. We don't understand. The way God teaches us is God will allow opposition in our life. And God says, go through it with me. I'm going to teach you something here. I'm going to put your faith to the fire, but stay with me. Live by your faith in the fire and you're going to come out like pure gold. I'm going to burn off the impurities through the fire. I'm telling you, he's saying something. We have to learn. We have to learn by what we go through. We have to learn that man will build you up to tear you down, but God will tear you down to build you up. We have to learn this. I'm telling us. I'm telling us. Let's see here what Jalen Downey says. I'm going to get back to it. Jalen says, when we learn to follow Christ and truly understand the sacrifice that he went through for us and understand that it is not about us anymore, we will be better people. Amen. We will be the children of God, Jalen. That's what we are. When we learn this, and this is what Paul is learning. I'm telling us, Paul says, I have learned both. Look at this. I have learned to be both full. He's saying, I've learned to be filled. I've learned to be filled. I've learned what it feels like to be filled. I know what it feels like. I know what that feeling feels like. But he says, I've also learned to be hungry. I've learned to be hungry. You know what he's saying? I've learned. I don't change who I am when I'm filled. And I definitely don't change who I am when I'm hungry. You better believe that after Jesus got baptized, he was led up by the spirit. No food, no water, 40 days, 40 nights. It was then he was led into the spirit because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Paul had learned. I've learned to be full. Oh, yeah, I can have a full belly, but when I'm hungry, I've also learned how to function and be hungry and still be filled on the word of God. Oh, I'm telling us something. He is saying, I've learned these things. He says, I've both. He says, both to abound, to have everything I need. Paul said, I've learned to have, I, I learned. I know what it means to have everything I need. And at the same time, I've also learned how to suffer need. I've learned how to suffer through need. Be patient. Be patient. Let God provide. Be patient. Oh, I'm telling us, and I know this is what this is saying, because that's why it makes so much sense that Paul says, I'm not saying this out of need. I'm telling you, if you're not paying attention, Paul is going a long way towards saying, thank you. But don't get it twisted. I'm not saying thank you because you have given me something. I'm thankful that you've given me something. But I'm not thankful and rejoicing because you've given me something. I'm rejoicing because you are now in the position to be able to give me something again because God has provided for you. Oh, I'm telling us the scripture is going to tell us this. Hold on a second. Sister Veronica says, look, she says, when you learn better, you do better. Each one teach one through the word. Amen. And we have to learn through the word, Sister Whitfield. We have to learn how to lose things. We have to learn how to lose things. I'm going to digress for a moment, but we have to learn how to lose things. We have to learn how to lose material things. We have to learn how to lose family. We have to learn how to lose family. I mean, lose friends. We have to learn how to lose things that we count as gain, popularity, all of these different things. We have to learn the accolades, all of the things that bring us gain, because I'm telling you every single day I see it. 
people would rather you accept their sin than live by what you believe. This is the world we live in. Accept it even if you don't believe it. Do y'all know two plus two equals five? No, no, actually two plus two equals four. But if you say it equals four, I'll put you in jail. Well, I don't care if you believe it. Just accept it. No. No. I don't care if the world calls bad good and good bad. No. I'm going to keep following Christ because I learn. I learn through those moments of where I am. I learn that I need to keep my same spiritual disposition. That no matter if I'm up or I'm down, if it's good or it's bad, I'm filled or I'm hungry, I'm on the top of the mountain or I'm in the valley, oh, I'm just going to keep my spirit just even kill, and I'm going to have joy in God because God giveth and God taketh away. I'm going to have joy in God. Oh, I'm telling us, I'm telling us because this is the moment because Paul is saying I am satisfied because I understand that Jesus is the satisfier. You can't be satisfied if you don't know who the satisfier is. And this is why people can't find satisfaction on this side of life because they, 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 they're, they're looking for satisfaction, but they don't want it through God. They don't want the satisfaction that comes from the word. They don't want to be on the bottom. They don't want to humble themselves. They don't want humility. No, they want to be satisfied by their own devices. But Paul says Jesus is the satisfier. Hold on a second. Sean said, look. Oh, I love it. He says, we live in a microwave society. People want God to respond immediately. We have to learn to be patient. We got to praise him even through the storms. Amen, Fowler. Sometimes your prayers are, are answered and people won't even notice because they are, are, they are in up times and don't notice the blessing. Amen, Deshaun Fowler. Amen. Let me put that on the screen again. Amen. And Paul is about to kind of reiterate what you're saying because he's recognizing Jesus is the satisfier. And that's why Paul says, I can do all things. Let's clarify now of what I've explained. I can do all things. I can. Watch how he phrases this. I can do. I can do it. And I can do all things. But what are you talking about, about Paul? Are you talking about sin? Are you talking about achieving any and every goal? No, because I was already in sin. I was already achieving the greatest goals. Or are you saying, Paul, you can, you can live however you want to? No, I've already tried that, and it didn't work. Well, what are the all things, Paul, that you are talking about? Paul says, I can do all things, meaning that no matter if I am up or I am down. I can do all the things that God wants me to do because the things that God wants me to do are not always predicated on what everyone else is going to do, wants me to do, or even if certain people are not providing. I can do those things, but not by myself. I can do all things through. Are we seeing this? We get some folks, they do things, get themselves in trouble, and then they say, oh, man, God, please get me out of trouble. Well, some things you're going to have to get through so you can get to God because you chose not to go through those things with God. So you got to get through it some kind of way. Well, the way you got to get to it through it is repent. You repent, and then God will go through it with you. But don't go and try to do any and everything you want to do and then still be calling on God. No, Paul is saying something. I can do all things, no matter what the situation, up or down, whether I have or I don't have, I can do all things. Why, why, why? Through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ who strengthens me. Well, well let's ask a question again. Well, how does Christ strengthen Paul? How does Christ strengthen Paul? Because I, I, I just can't stand when I hear people saying things and they don't know what they're saying. People want to sound good, but they're not doing good because they don't know what good is. Wait a minute. How? We, we, we got to the how did he learn? Well, well how does Christ strengthen him? Y'all ready for an aha moment? 
Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So here's the issue. Watch this. Paul is saying something very powerful. He realized something. He's not in the, in the ministry on the approval of the apostles. He's not in the ministry on the approval of man. He's not in the ministry on the approval of himself. He said, it is Christ our Lord who has enabled me. He realized something. Christ put me in the ministry. And I'm telling you, this is what's wrong. This is what's wrong with so many preachers. Some went, but they were not sent. How can he preach unless he is sent? Some women are going. I got news for you, ladies. Paul says, I suffer a woman not to teach. He does not want women preaching in congregations over men and women. Now, if you want to, if there's going to be some ladies event and you're going to teach those ladies, well, that's great. Teach those ladies. Older women, younger, older women, teach the younger women. Some cases, the younger women might even need to teach the older women because wisdom don't come with age. Amen, Walls. But as it applies, we, we, we need to understand something. It is God who puts us in the ministry through the word. How does he put us in the ministry through the word, Brother Boyd? Preach the word. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to get a doctorate, a master's, a bachelor's. I possess some of those things, but those things are not required. It is God who puts us in the ministry through the word of God. If we know the word, we live the word, we can teach the word. Amen. Look at this. He says that it is God who has put me into the ministry, not man. Because Paul would have been stopped long ago had he thought it was men. No, Christ enabled, empowered him, put him in the ministry. Y'all ready for another aha moment? Look at this. You know how he strengthened him? He strengthened him by humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Someone says, well, I'm not sure it's, e it's even, you can even have the mind of God. Well, why did Paul say, let this mind be in you? Let it be in you. Now, I like to deal with this word let sometimes, because when you look that word up in the dictionary, it means to not impede. See, some people, the reason why the mind of Christ is not in them is because they impede the mind of Christ being in them. They stop it from being in them because their will is greater than the Father's will. But Paul says, no, let this mind be. Let it be in you. Let it be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, the way we receive that today is we have to let it be in us through the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. Amen. That's how he strengthens him. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so what's being said here is if you read the rest of the story, he humbled himself. We are strengthened in weakness because when we are weak, God is strong. And when we are weak, God strengthens us. You better believe that when Paul says in the book of Ephesians, be strong in the Lord. He's not saying for us to actually be strong. He's actually saying, let God be your strength. Be strong in. No, be in. Abide in. Obey his commandments. Be in his word. Be in his spirit. And let God be your strength. Paul is saying something. I can do all things through Christ because it is Christ who is enabling me, Christ who is empowering me, Christ who is strengthening me. You don't believe me? Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I love it. It's one of the most powerful st case studies in the Bible. But when Paul prayed to God to take that thorn out of his flesh, you better believe that it's God who unleashed it on him. God unleashed it on him because Paul needed to learn. 
Paul was getting so popular, he needed to learn. So that he did not become conceited. God gave him a thorn in the flesh. It says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient. Paul prayed three times and God said, he's not going to take it out. My grace is sufficient. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Look, for my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. See, so, oh man, it's Christ who strengthened me. And then they go on to start bullying someone or cursing someone out or, or, or bringing wrath on somebody. No, no, that's your strength. Because the strength of God, it's humble. You humble yourself. And you let God's word, you let God's will be made perfect. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. It is the power of Christ that compelled him. It's the power of Christ that strengthened him. It's his weakness. It's the humility of Christ. It is his will to live for God that strengthens him. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities. Watch this. In reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. Do you see what he just said? Oh, I'm willing to be brought low. I'm willing to be brought low, God. I'm willing to be brought low, God. If that's going to push me towards you, God, if that's going to push me up in your eyes, oh, I'm willing to be brought low. Oh, you're not going to remove that thorn in the flesh? You, you, you're teaching me, God, your grace is sufficient because even though you have allowed this in my life, you are still with me with this thorn in my flesh in my life. And you're tearing me down so I don't build myself up. And what I mean by tearing me down, God has to continue to tear that old man or old woman off of us because even though we are new creatures, if we're not careful, we'll go back to our old habitat. We'll go back to the old us. You ever heard somebody say, oh, man, they don't want the old me. Amen, Walls, we don't want the old you. God wants the new you, the new creation. And from time to time when things come in our life, God has to tear. There's some things might be left over. There's some, some still a little bit of that skin. He has to be keep tearing it off. God tears us down to build us up. He says, I'm willing to be brought low. I'm willing to take these persecutions. I'm willing to go through these things that I have to go through with these people who don't like me for the cause of living righteously and preachers, preaching righteously and doing what you want to do. He says, I'll do all these things for Christ's sake. Why? Let's go back full circle. I do these things for Christ's sake because it's Christ who died for me. And if Christ who died for me, then I'm going to live for Christ. And if I'm going to be weak for Christ, and then I will let Christ be my strength. I will let Christ be my strength. He says, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. Then I'm strong. Humble myself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift me up. He will lift me up. Amen. Amen. I'm telling this. I don't have time. I don't have time, but I'm telling us, just go back and read the rest of Philippians chapter four, and I'm telling you, you will discover the rest of the story as Paul is telling it because it's very powerful when you look at what he's telling them because he's just saying something so simple. I'm not thanking you out of need because I know God will provide. I'm thanking you out of joy because you are sharing in the ministry and God has blessed you to be able to have that opportunity again. Verse 14, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. You see what he's saying? We're partners in the ministry. No, no, no. You're not the cause of the ministry. You're just partnering in a ministry that God has put me in through Christ. It is Christ who enables me. Thank you. Thank you. You have helped. 
but God would have provided regardless. But I'm thankful that God has put you back in that position and given you that opportunity. Now, you Philippians know also that at the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you said aid once and again for my necessities. 17 again, not that I seek the gift. Not that I seek the gift. He's saying I'm, I'm not seeking your money. I'm not seeking your money. I'm going to make this point and I'm done. From time to time, people will gift me things to help me with the ministry. And I'm so thankful for it. It has enabled me to buy equipment and, and, and things of that nature. But I always tell my wife, it's not the gift that ever impresses me. What always gets to me is that somebody thought enough about the ministry. Not me. They thought enough about the ministry. They thought enough that the word that you're preaching, I believe, it can help people. So let me put this in your life so you can help more people. I'm always blown away by that because I'm like, people care about the ministry. Paul is saying something. Not that I seek to give, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. It is more blessed to give than to receive that you are actually putting equity into your own heavenly account. You are doing this for the cause of the ministry, and God is pleased. He says, I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from me prayer that is the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice. Look, well... Pleasing to God and my God shall supply your need. Now, isn't it, isn't it powerful? He just said, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking out of need. Because you know what Paul is acknowledging? Because just like God provided for me through you, God is going to provide for you through me, through him, through others. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, I'm telling us, man, when we truly understand what was being said, I can do all things. I can do all things no matter. I can do all things that God wants me to do. No matter if I'm up or down. Because God is going to provide. When we understand that, and that this is on account of, because of, and for Christ, for the salvation of ourselves and the salvation of others, we'll be able to do everything that God wants us to do. All the things that God wants us to do. Amen. Amen. Oh, man, I'm done. Sister Veronica said, yes, God uses people in ways they don't even understand. Look at God. Thank you, Father, for the ministry. Amen. Amen. I am telling us, God is, oh, man, I'm telling us. This, this, this all things, it has always gotten to me when you really understand the context of what Paul is saying. It, it is so powerful. Man, I am telling you. Oh, man, to God be the glory. Welcome, Sister McKinney. Glad you tuned in. I am telling us, God is real. God is real. And we need to help people to understand not only is he real, but he will work in your life if you will let him. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. So until tomorrow, oh man, it's Friday. You know, I'm a, we're going to go, we're going to go out on Friday with a blessed, blessed word. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. once again, 
share this. Thank you for tuning in live and those who come back and watch it later, share it. And tonight, by the way, I will be on the Oak Leaf Digital Bible Study and I'll be doing a study on Nadab and Abihu. Oh man, we're going to have a great time in the Lord tonight at 6 p.m. my time, 7 p.m. Andre's time, which I'm thinking he's down in Florida. Yes, he's in Florida. So 7 p.m. his time. I'll be back tonight at 6 p.m. Oh man, we're going to have another great time in the Lord in this blessed word of God. So once again, until the next time, May God bless you. May God keep you. Peace. Oh, no man coming unto the Father except they come through He. He is the way. Oh, he is the truth. Oh, he, he is the light. I said that He is the way. The way. The way. I know that He. The truth, the truth, the truth. I said that he is the, the way, way, he is the, the truth, he is the lie. I know that he is the way, the way, I know he is the way, the truth, the truth, I said the truth. that he is the, the way, way, the truth, the lie. Listen to me now. Ooh. No man coming unto the Father except they come through he. He is the way, yeah. he is the truth, oh. he is the lie. Listen to me. No man coming unto the Father except they come through he. Oh, he is the truth. He is the life. I said that he is the way, the way, the truth, the truth. I said that he is the way, he is the truth. Oh, the life. I know that he is the way, the way, the truth, the truth. I know that he is the way, the truth, the life. And Philip asked me, said, Lord, can you show us the Father, and that'll be enough for me?